if you have the time to kind of glance through the, the video of the other class, sometimes it's helpful. Right. Well, it is 10.30. I'm going to get started here. Um, I think last time we were done with explaining comparison, and that's why you guys got the lab, you know, to work on comparison. So what we'll do today is kind of to move on in the same order as in Canvas, and we'll start to talk about <clears throat> floating point numbers. So this is the floating point number uh, representation module. And we can get started here. Did we talk about scientific notation last time? Yeah, I think we did, but I don't. I cannot remember how far we got into the floating point um, discussion. So let me just go back to the video and take a look. So last time is like two days ago, so that would be the seventeenth. That's why the video is so handy because you know I can look at it too. And just kind of look at okay. So what we what did we talk about? All right. So looks like I didn't use an example. No, I did. Okay. So I used an example in base two. Okay, that's good. All right. So so this is really handy. All right. So what we'll do today is a continuation of what we talked about the, the other day on Monday. And what we'll do today is really just start to th look into the exact standard of the IEEE double precision floating point number format. Okay. <clears throat> and it helps to bring up the Wikipedia page on this. So here's the uh, Wikipedia page. And we have seen this last time as well. So the, Wiki the Wikipedia page on floating point number. Um, explain things kind of like this in the picture. We saw this last time as well. Um, the pink or salmon color part is basically the fractional part of the mantissa. Okay, I think we explained what a mantissa is um, yeah, last time. The green part is actually the most confusing part. The green part is responsible to specify the exponent of 2 because it's base 2, except it is not exactly in a signed number format, nor is it exactly in an unsigned number format. Okay, so what you do is you look, you look at these eleven bits as an unsigned number, but the value of that unsigned number is biased. In other words, if this is um, spelling out all zeros, the actual exponent of two is negative one thousand twenty-three, because the value is offset or biased. By 1,023. Now you might want to ask why not 1,024? Because that will make it just you know, using the two's complement notation. Don't ask me. Okay, <coughs> I have no idea why the IEEE organization decided to use a bias of 1,023 as opposed to 1,024, which will make it two's complement, which is very it, ma it makes perfect sense in that case. 1,023 is only off by one, so you know in terms of the magnitude of numbers that we can represent, it's only like doubling. Okay, so it's, we're not losing a whole lot by using that kind of strange 1,023 value. So you can also see how we can look at a value represented using these two expressions. They are equivalent, just you know different notations. So the first one says you know, negative one, negative one to the power of sine. Sine refers to the sine bit, which is the, the, the light blue color bit. Okay, negative one to the power of zero is one, so it's non-negative, and negative one to the power of one is negative one, so the quantity is now negative. So that takes care of the sine part. The mantissa part is kind of interesting. Because remember, I said the, the, the salmon colored portion is only the fractional part of the mantissa. What, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean there's a, always an implicit one point, okay? So that part is always there. And then the rest of the bits to the right hand side of the point would be B52 and then all the way down to B0. Okay, so that's what I meant when I said the one point is implicit. Okay, 
if you don't want to look at it that way, you can always do the sigma notation, which is which to me is a little bit more complicated, but it's the same thing. So the one plus is always there, and then the sigma notation goes from one to fifty-two, where the bit destination is fifty-two minus i. So that will go basically go from b fifty-one all the way down to b zero, and then the power of two is two to the power of negative i, which means the power is going to go from negative one all the way down to negative fifty-two. Is that okay? But it boils down to exactly the same thing here. It's just you know, notation-wise, you know, some people prefer to lo look at it like this. You know, tell me where the bits are going. Okay. Some other people like the more mathematical notation and go like, okay, what is each bit representing in the value represented here? So you can pick either one. The exponent, as I said a little bit earlier, is what we call a biased number. So e by itself is referring to the green portion interpreted as an unsigned number. So you look at 11 bits as an unsigned number. Whatever the unsigned value is, you subtract 1023 from it, and that becomes the actual exponent of 2 that you want to multiply to the mantissa. So do we have any questions about this part, the explanation of the various parts of a floating point number representation? Yes. So the exponent of two b uh, e minus uh, one thousand twenty three is always like negative. No, no, because uh, because the green portion has eleven bits, which means it can go from zero to two thousand forty seven. Mm -hmm. So that means you know if e itself is one thousand twenty three, which are basically all ones ex except for the most significant bit, that actually represents an exponent of zero. Mm -hmm. Sure. So are we clear on that concept, more or less? Okay, so what we'll do today in this class, you know, to start with, is we'll go through a conversion, okay? So we'll just pick a particular value that we know in base 10, and then we'll convert that value into a double precision floating point number format. I'll go through a process to show how you can verify that, that your interpretation is correct, and then we'll go from there. Okay, <clears throat> so it's going to be mostly an example, and if, but if you do have any questions anytime, you know, let me know because you know it is best to answer those questions as you have the questions. So I'm going to go back to the tablet, okay, and let's see what number should we pick today. I'm not. Gonna, I'm going to pick a different number compared to um, the Tuesday Thursday class. So I'm going to pick a negative number this time. You know, I worked with a non-negative number last time, so now I'm going to work with a negative number. And let's pick, uh, doesn't have to be very complicated. So I'm going to try like 49.625. Okay, this is my base 10 representation of the value that I want to represent using a double precision floating point number format. Is that okay? All right, so there are many ways to get started with this, okay? <clears throat> the first part is to translate that into a binary number. Well, one thing that we know is easy, the sign bit. What do you think is the value of the sign bit? It's going to be one because it's a negative value. So we look at this negative sign and we go like, mm, okay, we know the sign bit is going to be a one. That's the easy part. The rest, we'll kind of work it out. So the first thing is, you know, since this number is reasonably small, um, I don't think I can, you know, I need to work with shifting the binary point and stuff like that first. So we'll start with, you know, converting 49.625 to a binary number. Okay, that's the, that's what I would work with first. So what you need to do in your head is to imagine once again, you know, this is a currency system. You know, the denominations are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on, on the non-negative powers of 2. On the negative side of powers of 2, we have half, quarter, eighth, sixteenth, and so on. Okay, is that okay? So in your pocket, you have all of these denominations. The nice thing about base 2 is you need to use at the most one of each denomination. 
So it's not like in Bates 10 where we don't, sometimes you might need like five ones, okay? Other times you might need to use two tens and so on. In binary numbers, you, you only need to use at the most one of the denomination. Sometimes it's none, but at the most one. Is that okay? Okay. So I'm going to lay this out in a particular format. I, I tend to use a different format, you know, in each class, so, which is actually intentional. This is 2 to the power of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then we got negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Okay, so we'll stop with negative 3. And then we say, okay, 1, 2 to the power of 0 is 1, 2 to the power of 2 is 2, 2 to the power of 1 is 2, 2 to the power of 2 is 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. On the other side, we have 1 half, 1 quarter, and 1 eighth. So the top row is really just you know, telling you the exponent, and then the bottom row is telling you the power of 2, but it's in base 10. So we're still working pretty much in base 10 right now. Are we good so far? All right. So now we do the base conversion, which is something that we did like maybe in the second class or the third class or so. Okay, but it's the same thing. So we look at 49.625 and we say, do we have a 64 in that value? Nope, okay, give it a zero. Do we have a 32? Yep, there's a 32, so what you do is, it's just like you're giving change to a customer at McDonald's, okay? So you say, oh, okay, I got a 32 already, so let's see how much is remaining. The remaining portion is $17 and you know, $17.625, okay? So then you look at 16, do we need a 16? Yep, we need a 16. Do we need an eight after that? Nope, because we only got one left. Do we need a four? Nope. Do we need a two? Nope. Do we need a one? Yes. Okay. So now that handles all the non-negative side of the powers of two. So now we move on to the negative side of powers of two. So one thing that some people did that was incorrect from the Tuesday, Thursday class was to look at 620, 625 as quote unquote 625 and try to convert it into a binary number as 625. That doesn't work because it is 605, six, if you look at it as 625, the unit is gonna be a milli, a thousandth, okay? But when we're converting into base two, we are not talking about thousandths. We're talking about halves, quarters, eighths, sixteenths, and so on. So do not look at 625 as quote unquote 625. Look at it as one particular value, 0.625 as one particular value. And then you look at what you can use here to fill that up, so to speak. Okay? So do we think that there's a half in 0.625? A half is 0.5. Yes, okay, we'll pick one up. Okay, so we say, yep, we got one of those. So once you pick up the half, then we have 0.125 left. So within the 0.125, do we have a quarter, which is 0.25? Nope, none of those. And what is left is an eighth, which is exactly 0.125. So we have one of those as well. So are we okay so far with the conversion from base 10 to base two? The base 10 representation is 49.625, and then the binary representation is 0110001.101. Is that okay? All right. So this part really is just testing whether you understand what a number is representing, how a number represents a value. In base 10, we got nine ones, four tens, six tenths, two hundredths, and five thousandths. Okay, those are all powers of 10. Each digit is telling me how many of those powers of 10 do we have in the value. In base two, kind of the same thing, except each digit is now telling me the presence or the absence of a particular power of two. But it works exactly the same way, except the base is changed from 10 to two. So, are there any questions before we move on? No questions? All right. So 
And then we move on and we, we look at this number and we go like, this is something that we did last time as well, but I'm going to do it again here. Okay, so do you think it will mess up the value represented if I just do something like this? Multiply that thing by 2 to the power of 0. Well, 2 to the power of 0 is 1. It doesn't really change the value of the product. Okay, not a problem. So if I do something like this, I shift the point. Okay, do you see how I shift the point um, one place to the left? Okay, <clears throat> when you do something like this in base 10, what happened to the value when you shift the decimal point from to the left by one digit? What are you actually doing to the value of the number? Sorry? Well, let's not worry about the exponent part, okay? By shifting the, by the decimal point in base 10, what are you doing to the, to the value represented? You're dividing by 10, okay? It becomes one-tenth of what it used to be, right? So what do you think it's going to do in base 2? It <laughs> exactly, it divides it by 2, okay? So it divides it by 2, but I don't want to change the value represented. So can I do something about the exponent here and adjust it so that I'm still representing exactly the same value? Yeah, 2 to the power of 1. Okay, so I have to increase the power of the, uh, I have to increase the exponent by 1 to compensate for that quote-unquote division by 2 by shifting that binary point. Is that okay? So I can do the same thing here. So I, I'm, I'm just doing it in a very boring way because you kind of know Oops, back. There you go. Mm -hmm. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, one in base two. Mm -hmm. Three, one, one, zero, one. Oops, I forgot to put the point here. This is the last one. Two, three, one, two, two, two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that okay? Every time we shift the binary point to the left, we increase the exponent by one. Is that good? Okay. So in this particular case, the fractional part of the mantissa would be one zero 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 one one zero one. That's the fractional part. What about to what 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 happens to the one point? That's implicit. It's never actually stored in a double precision floating point number. So that part is just left out entirely. It's just assumed that we have that part. The part that is actually represented using a bits would be the fractional part, which is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And a whole bunch of zeros after that. Is that okay? All right, so we, we got the uh, fractional, fr fractional part of the mantissa done now. What about the exponent? Our, the exponent that we want is 5. Okay. So we have to now take a look at 5 and say, this is what we really want. But remember, E is biased. In other words, we want E minus 1,023 to be 5. Does that make sense? OK? And E is the 11-bit unsigned value of the green portion. OK? But it's biased by 1,023. So if I want to figure out what E is supposed to be, how do I work this out in algebra? I subtract both sides. Uh, I subtract minus 1,023 from both sides, right? So it becomes E equals to 5 minus negative 1,023. And that becomes 5 plus 1,023, which is 1,028, right? Okay. Well, since we are already here, might as well convert it into a base 2 number. So to convert this into a base 2 number, I have to express this as a sum of base 2 uh, powers of 2. So the first one is going to be 1024, which is 2 to the power of 10. And whatever is left is just a 4, which is already a power of 2. So I'm done. So once I'm at this point, then I will start to do the conversion into base 2. So the conversion into base 2 is to look at a, okay, let, let me fill in this step first. This is 2 to the power of 10. This is 2 to the power of 2. 
2 to the power of 10 as a base 2 number, as a binary number, is 1 followed by 10 zeros. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in base 2, representing 2 to the power of 10. And 2 to the power of 2 is 1 followed by 2 zeros in base 2. So when you add up these two, doesn't really matter what doesn't matter what base you're in, it will still give you the same answer. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, zero, zero, in base two. So now we have figured out what E is supposed to be. The eleven bits, the green portion that those eleven bits, is supposed to be one zero 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 one zero zero in base two. Are we okay so far? Yes. Because that because the E, which is the green portion of a floating point number, is biased by 1023. So whatever that unsigned number is, you have to subtract 1023 to get to the actual exponent that we want. So in this case, the actual exponent that we want is 5. So I want to go backwards and figure out what that green portion is supposed to be. So are we still okay? All right. Okay. So we got all the components figured out at this point. So if I, re if I rewrite that entire thing, the double number, is going to start with the 1, which is our sign. And then we have the E, which is the number that we just figured out, which is 1, followed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 zeros. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then 1, 0, 0 after that. And then we have the fractional part of the mantissa, which is up here. And I'm going to do the lazy thing. of copying and pasting. There we go. <laughs> Only with a tablet, right? I mean, on a, on the whiteboard, I could not have done that. <clears throat> All right, so we got the major components done. You look at this and go like, that doesn't look like 64 bits to me. So what are we going to do? Pat zeros to the right or the left? To the right. Okay, very good. So we pad zeros to the right until we have 64 bits. Because these zeros are really just you know, uh, extra zeros in the fractional part of the mantissa. So it doesn't really change the value that we are representing. It's just filling it up so that we have 64 bits. So I'm going to represent that as dot, 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 oops, error, okay, dot, 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 and a bunch of zeros. So you look at this and go like, wow, that's a lot of digits. 64 to be exact. So how do we test this? Well, before we can test it, I think it will be, it will be helpful to use a representation where it's easier to enter into the computer. So here we're going to start with um, base 16 numbers. Base 16 numbers are also called, they're also called hexadecimal numbers. Hexa is 6, deci is 10. So when you combine hexi and hexi and deci, hexa and then deci, then you have 16. So it's base 16. So it'll go like base 16. Now in base 10, we got 0 to 9. In base 7, we got 0 to 6. In base 2, we got 0 and 1. So in base 16, we need, what, 15 unique digits for each place. But we only got 10 digits from 0 to 9. What are we going to do about the, the ones that are not available? So what I'm going to do is I will show you a table, and you can copy that if you want to. You don't have to. So we'll start with um, bits here. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1, 1. Wow, it just, I, I, I did not plan for this, it just kind of worked out. 
<laughs> okay. So the four bit pattern zero 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 zero, what value is it representing? Zero. The next one? One. Okay, so you got well zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Everything is pretty good up to this point. And then we go like, is the next one one zero? No. Because in base 16, one zero means zero of ones and one of 16. So that means the value of 16. We don't want to use one zero here. So we are going to borrow letters from the alphabet. Okay. So we, we see A, B, C, D, E, F for these particular values. So the digit A means 10, you know, for that particular, you know, digit. And then we have B, C, D, E, and F. So this is a table that you can memorize over time. And that's how we convert from between base 2 and base 16. It's really just a table lookup. There's no division, no comparison, no multiplication involved. It's very quick. And once you know this table, it's really fast as well. Is that OK? Does anyone know how to enter a base 16 or hexadecimal number in C and C++? They never talked about it in 360? OK, one of the most important things you know, that can be covered in like two minutes, it's a 0x. So the prefix 0x in C and C++ means the rest of that number, all of those digits are hexadecimal digits. So 0x is the prefix for hexadecimal numbers. All right, OK. So I'm going to scroll up again, you know, which, which means this table is going to disappear. But you can always just kind of you know, stop the frame in YouTube, you know, copy and paste it, and then print it out. Or make your own, okay? you know, if you don't like my you know, kind of poor penmanship. I, was, uh, I received a lot of punishment as a kid um, because I keep forgetting to bring my homework, you know, keep chatting in class and stuff like that. I was very distracted and distracting at the same time as a, as a student. Um, so I was, you know, um, so but the teachers you know, always you know, say, okay, now you know, the punishment is always you know, like writing something over and over again, but never really improved my penmanship. <laughs> there's, there's something about, you know, I just want to get this done as quickly as possible that is conflicting with the idea of maybe this will help improve his penmanship. Anyway, so, we, so to do the conversion, you have to uh, make these into blocks of four bits. Okay? So we look at these four as one block. And you look at the table. Okay? This one is still actually visible. It's C. We look at the next block. That's a 0. The next block is a 4. The next block is an 8. The next block is a D. And then the rest are all zeros in hexadecimal. So this way, we have a not too bad representation of a 64-bit number. How many hexadecimal digits do I need to represent exactly 64 bits? 16. And how did, how did you get 16? Exactly, 64 bits divided by 4 bits per hexadecimal digit gives us 16 hexadecimal digits. Which you might think, oh, like, wow, that's a lot of digits. But in base 10, it'll be even longer. I think in base 10, it's going to be like three digits longer. It's not by much, but it is longer. So hexadecimal is actually more space efficient compared to decimal. All right. So now, you know, I, so the, the number that I claim, or the hexadecimal representation of the bit pattern of the 64, a double precision floating point number that represents negative 49.625 is supposed to be that big mess. OK? So let me just kind of write out that big mess first. And then we'll, I'll show you, can we double check that? So 0x. C, 0, 4, 8, D, 0. And how many more zeros do we need? Let's see. Did I miss something? C, 0, 4, 
8D. Yep, okay. How many zeros do we need all together? After the D? 11, that's right. So we have one, oops, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think that should make 11 zeros. Do we count? Yep, 11 zeros. Yep. Because that's a prefix in C and C++. Um, if you just say you know, C048 blah, 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 it will be considered a variable name. But if you put a 0x before that, then the C compiler would know, oh, you're about to start a hexadecimal number. And it knows they can expect 0 to 9, A to F as in digits. Mm -hmm. OK, so I make this claim. Yep, go ahead. No, in, when it's stored, it is actually in binary, in bits, right? So this is only a way so that we can look at 64 individual bits, but without actually spelling out using 64 spaces, you know, on the screen. But the, like, the memory that they have, like, Nope, it's, it's, okay, in RAM, it is, it's not even hexadecimal or binary, it's whether the gate is outputting high or outputting low. So you have 64 quote unquote gates that are in the sequence and each one can have a high or a low voltage as the output. So in this case, you know, we are looking at high, high, and then low, 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 high, low, low, high, low, 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 high, high, low, and so on. If you have a tiny little voltmeter and go ahead and measure those, you know, connection points, that's what you'll be seeing on your multimeter. So, so the computer doesn't use you know, uh, hexadecimal or even zeros and ones as representation. It's just you know, the voltage of the output of the gates. So this is for our consumption only, you know, so that we can visualize you know, what is being stored internally. OK, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. OK, so I make this claim that this big mess here, this 16-digit hexade hexadecimal number is representing the 64 bits that in return is the IEEE double precision floating point number representation of the value negative 49.625. Don't ask me to say that again because that's pretty long. <laughs> this is the second time I said it, by the way, today. Um, so are you just going to buy that? No. So how do we check it? How do we check that, you know, hey, you know, this, it doesn't look that way, right? I mean, you know, pff, this is just a bunch of, you know, random hexadecimal digits. You know, how can it possibly be representing negative 49.625? So how do we check that? Okay, so we can do that, you know, by following the, the steps, but in a backward you know, manner. Now, that is not a bad idea, except, yep, go ahead. Well, to base 10 doesn't really help, okay? So the base 10 representation of the bit pattern behind the hexadecimal number is not going to be even close to 49 point, uh, negative 49.625. Okay, so I, I will show you the, the trick to do it. But let me explain, you know, um, the one pitfall of trying to reverse the process, you know, like convert this back into binary, chop it back into the individual parts, and then reinterpret the in individual parts uh, to figure out the value. If I made a mistake in my understanding of how the format works, that, that mistake would be consistent when I reverse the process. So the reversing of the process will probably get back to negative 49.625, but that's only because I made the same mistake twice. So that would, so I would not be able to catch that type of mistake. I would be able to catch mistakes like, did I miss a zero? Okay, did I miss a one? Did I misplace the point somewhere? So those mistakes I can catch, but not a mistake of a misunderstanding of the format. Okay, so let me show you how you you know, can also, you know, kind of check whether this is the correct number or not. 
So I'm going to put this here just so that it is stays visible to me. And then we'll go ahead and use this thing here. Okay, let me move this to the other screen. Uh, move to right. There we go. And now it should be here somewhere. There you go. Okay, so uh, I did this already with a Tuesday, Thursday class, so the program is already here. So I'll show you the program in C that I used. That's the program. You go like, this program doesn't even have a double type. How can this program be possibly used to check whether that is, that is working or not? Doesn't seem to make sense, right? Now, but there are several things in this program that, that are worth mentioning. The first thing is about the pound include. The pound include is including a header file called std, which is standard, int, which is integer, dot h. So it is pound including a header file that says standard integer. Well, what that does is it brings in the type definitions for something like this. U stands for unsigned. Int, obviously, is integer. 64 means it is 64-bit wide, not 32 not 16, it's exactly 64 bit wide. Underscore t is really just a suffix that for some reason they want to include to emphasize this is a type. Now, you can probably guess that they also have uint 32 underscore t if you want to use 32 bit unsigned integers, uint 16 underscore t if you want to use 16 bit unsigned integers, and even uint 8 underscore t if you want to use 8 bit unsigned integers. So the big question is, why do we have to designate the width of the integer? Um, why is that even important? Well, the thing is, if you say unsigned, which implicitly is an unsigned integer, you don't really know what the width is. If you're, if you're using a 32-bit platform, like an older you know, Linux box, and, and, and unsigned is, by default, 32-bit wide. If you're on a newer architecture, which I'm on, the default is 64-bit wide. If you're doing Arduino programming with an 8-bit processor, it's actually 16-bit wide. So the actual width of the integer varies depending on what the GCC compiler is targeting, what processor, what architecture it is targeting. So why would that be a problem to you? If you're doing some kind of calculations, okay, uh, involving, let's say, squares or powers or something like that, you'll be exercising a pretty good range of values. So if the value that you need to work with requires 64 bits, okay, then your program will work fine when you're compiling the program on a 64-bit platform because, you know, by default, unsigned is 64-bit wide. And then one day, you might want to port that program to, let's say, a Raspberry Pi, or an Arduino, and you keep using unsigned. On a Raspberry Pi, unsigned means 32-bit wide. On, a, a, on an Arduino, an unsigned is 16-bit wide. So you have exactly the same code without changing it, but it's not going to work anymore because there's not enough bits on those architectures. By using these particular types, uint64 underscore t, you are telling the compiler, do whatever you have to, but I want an integer that is 64-bit wide. So this time, you know, this code is going to run exactly the same way regardless of the architecture. You can compile this code using a you know, modern you know, i7 architecture, 64-bit wide, it will work. You can uh, cross-compile this on an Arduino, it will still work. You can cross-compile this on the Raspberry Pi. It will still work. So it makes sure that your code is robust and portable across architectures. Well, is that an important thing? Not if you're Microsoft. <laughs> but for the rest of the world, yes, it is important. I said it's not important to Microsoft because how many architectures does Windows support? Very few architectures, right? Well, do you think Microsoft wants to only limit their support to like these few architectures? Probably not. I mean, they, they want to sell their licenses you know, to all kinds of devices, right? If they could, they want to license you know, Fitbit 
to use Windows, but it won't, you know, it won't work. There's no Windows available on the architecture that is running you know, on my Fitbit. Why is that? I think, I'm guessing, it's because of programming practice like this. They were not careful about you know, cross-architectural you know, concerns, so the code that they write you know, is not easily ported across architectures. Th this is not the only thing, but there are many other things that can uh, contribute to not being able to support multiple architecture, but this is one of them. So enough you know, sidetrack. So we'll go ahead and exit from the editor, and then we'll go into GDB. GDB stands for uh, GNU Debugger. It's basically just a debugger, and this is the command line debugger. Some of you may be familiar with uh, code blocks, okay, depending on who was your CISP 360 and 400 professor. Um, so code blocks is basically a GUI front end on top of um, GDB. So when you set a breakpoint in a code blocks by right clicking, you know, at the left side of the line, you're basically doing some kind of command in GDB. GDB is just the command line version to get everything done. Okay, so I can list the program, put a breakpoint on line nine, right before the return zero, and then I can run the program. Okay, obviously the program doesn't do much. Okay, if I print the value of x, what do you think x should be at this point? I'm right about to execute line nine. Eight, okay, so I would say, I would think so. Okay, so x does have a value of eight. So what I'm gonna do now in GDB is I'm gonna change the value of x. I'm gonna change the value of x to what we had earlier, which is this number here. You don't have to be able to see it because you know, I'm just gonna put it here. It's C048D and then 11 zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Okay, press the enter key, took it without a problem. Let's, let's check, okay? Ooh, wait, that doesn't look like a C something. Well, that's in decimal, okay? So the number that I entered earlier, which is, Z, which is a hexadecimal or base 16 number, C, 0, 4, 8, D, blah, blah, blah. In decimal, this is what it looks like, which is nothing like negative 49.625, okay? If I print it in hexadecimal, which is slash x, you know, as a syntax, it would give us back, you know, what we entered earlier. And I think GDB can print in binary as well with a slash t. Um, so we'll say slash t x. And that's the 64-bit version of the same integer. Does that match what, uh, what we want? Let's double check. I mean, we, we're seeing it, you know, side by side. Not, yeah, it is side by side, just top side versus downside. So it's one one zero zero, and then zero 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 zero, zero one zero zero, one zero zero zero, one one zero one, and a bunch of zeros. So I did enter correctly. Okay, so I'm just showing you in GDB you have the option of looking at something as decimal, hexadecimal with a slash x, or binary with a slash t. Pretty handy sometimes. Okay, but we are not seeing what we want to see. So some of you may think, well, maybe we can just cast it. So we'll just cast it into a double. Okay, that's not going to work. It's not going to work because casting is only casting the value of x. It is not looking at the bit representation of x in a different way. So it doesn't have anything to do with the reinterpretation of the underlying bits. It is really just looking at the unsigned value and then say, oh, how do we represent that in, as a double? So if you print this, you'll get something pretty close to what we had, okay? Eh, except, you know, it's a little bit different. How is that different? You can see 3, 2, 5 are no longer there. We lost precision. We lost three decimal digits worth of precision. So, but it, for the rest, you know, it's, it's about the same. Either way, it's not negative 49.625, okay? Because we are only 
looking at the same value, but this time we are, we are representing it as a double. We are not reinterpreting the underlying zeros and ones and say, let's look at these things in a different way. That's not what this casting is doing. Okay, so if a simple cast is not going to get a job done, let's try something like this. So I'm constructing this backwards, so don't try to copy it because I, I will keep making changes. So we we'll start with x and then go like, okay, let's go to get to this. What, what is that notation? The address of x, okay, which is just a location in memory, but it does have a type of a u in 64 underscore t asterisk because it is the address of a unsigned 64b integer. Okay. Do you guys remember you can do uh, type casting? But this time I'm doing a type casting like this. So what am I doing? What what I'm doing here is to say, okay, let's start with x, which is a variable it lives in memory. I take the address of that. Okay? So I'm not concerned about the content, I just want to know where it is, which is an address. But the address has a type of a 64-bit unsigned integer address. So I'm casting it and say, no, 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 don't look at it as a 64-bit unsigned integer address, look at it as the address of a double. Now, typecasting is one of the very few things that is really cool in C and C++. It's also extremely dangerous as well because you can cast an address of something into the address of whatever else that you want it to cast to. So, so it, can, it can be a lot of trouble, but it's a lot of fun too, like in this example. But ultimately, I'm not interested in the address. I'm interested in the interpretation of what is at the address. So once I have the address, how do I look at the content of the address? With which operator do we use? The asterisk symbol, which is known as dereference. Okay? So I add a dereference here. So now it's going to work. Okay? So to explain it one more time, okay? and you have to kind of read it in backwards because that's how C notation is, we start, with the, we, we start with x. Then we take the address of x. Then we cast the address of x to the address of a double. And then we dereference that. All right. So hopefully we are getting back to at least close to the value that we want, and it's actually exact. Do we have any questions about this example? Does this example illustrate why CISP 360 is the prerequisite of this class? How many people remember all this stuff from CISP 360? The address of, the referencing, casting. Okay, very good. We'll see more of these things. Cool. Now, yeah, go ahead. Um, the parentheses around the typecaster are necessary. That's part of the syntax. But you can add additional, an additional pair of parentheses between the asterisk and the first open paren. You can put an open paren there, and then you can put a close paren there. But that one is not necessary because of the way the operators are associated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do we have any other questions about the demonstration here? No questions? So once again, I have to re-emphasize that I'm not a mind reader. If you do have a question in your head, if you don't tell me, I cannot, I, cannot, I cannot get the question. So you have to raise your hand and ask the question in order for me to know there's a question and in order to address the question. Go ahead. Well, I'll help you formulate. So you're, you're pulling an address of x, uh -huh. casting it as a double, and then... As an address of a double. As the address of a double, and yep. then you just display that. You just run the address of x, mm -hmm. and you just cast it as a double. But it seems weird to me, because it's like you're looking at the value of the address, or you're looking at the value at the address. 
Okay, so let me see if I can uh, think of an example to illustrate this. I'm just going through several, you know, ways to explain this in my head right now. I need something that has multiple interpretations that we are familiar with. So that's what I'm looking for right now. Okay, I got it. Okay. So, um, well, I'm going to use the tablet because, you know, that makes it recorded. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to write a phrase in Chinese. So these are Chinese characters. And I forgot how to write this. <laughs> oh, okay, that's it. Okay. Uh, that means, you know, by oneself, okay, alone. Okay. So, of course, you know, unless you also understand, you know, Chinese characters or kanji, you know, if you're Japanese, this has very little meaning to you, okay? But I can still tell you, you know, this is character, you know, zero, this is character one, and this is character two. So, in other words, each one has an address. I can, I can say, Oh, which one is the third character? Okay, you can tell, oh, okay, it's this guy here that looks like a three with a bar, you know, in between, right? Okay, so, so the concept of the address is completely separated from the interpretation of what is at the address. Are we good? Yep. Yep. Yes. So it couldn't be negative to the computer. So it just that weird number we got. It's was the what it thought it was. It's the interpretation. Okay. So so if I you know, if if this is you know an array. Okay. Let me let me see how I can uh, how, if I can explain this. So let's say this is an array. Okay. So a bracket zero is this thing. A bracket one is this thing. And then a bracket two is this thing, okay? All right. So, and what do you think is going to be the the type of the array? What is the type of the element of the array? Chinese characters, right? Okay. So we'll say you know Chinese char a bracket three. Yeah, you know, that's basically the type of the array. Makes sense, right? Okay. So. Let's see if I can use this uh, to illustrate it. So if I take um, the address of a bracket zero, what is that going to give you? It's just telling you where to find the first character in the array. Nothing more. Okay. Does that ha have anything to do with whether you understand Chinese or not? Absolutely not. Okay, you just have to say, oh, well, there are three of those, and we are only interested in the first one. Okay, that's the address of. But it ha it does have a type. Okay, the address of the first character is a ch Chinese character. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is, oh, I need to move this one up a little bit. So the next thing I'm going to do is to say, I don't look at it as the address of a Chinese character. Look at it as a math mathematical operator. Okay, so we'll say you know math operator address. So we are still looking at we are still concerning about where we are talking about, but now I'm saying oh that's not the location of a Chinese character anymore. It is now the location of a math operator. Okay, but. Even up to this point, we're only concerned about the address, not the content. It's just where where are we talking about here, okay? But what is the type of this where, this location? It's no longer the position of a Chinese character. It is now the position of a math operator, okay? Then I add the asterisk and say, now tell me what it is. Oh, that looks like a minus to me. 
Is that okay? Or, does, or did I make it worse? Because a lot of times I try to come up with, you know, analogies, and then in the worst case, it makes it worse. People get even more confused. And most of the time, people just remember the analogy and not really remember what it is supposed to explain. <laughs> yep. Interpret those 64 bits as the bits of a double. Yep. And then tell me what is the value represented by that double. Yep. Okay. So it looks like we got a kind of more or less a handle on this. Yep. Is this the equivalent to uh, reinterpret cast? Reinterpret cast. It's probably not linked to object-oriented programming concepts. This is pretty low level. This is like you know, really, really basic you know, C function or C uh, functionality of C. So it's not linked in, it's not tied into any uh, C++ object-oriented concepts. So I don't think it's related to what you just said. Um, I think this is really just a quote unquote, you know, pretty typical um, casting of an address. Any other questions? No questions? All right. Well, if there are no questions, then I can reverse the problem. Okay, because you know, I you know, this time, you know, let me reverse the problem. And what I'll do is I'm gonna set do the set var again. But this time I'm gonna set the var to something <laughs> like that. I, I changed a portion of that to just you know uh, ABC. In fact, I'm, let me see. I think I can change a little bit more than that. Uh, oh, I just did a delete. Ah, okay. Let's redo this whole thing. Let's just change this part to ABC, and then we'll need um, 10 zeros after that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's make one more zero, because um, otherwise the value is going to be pretty difficult to spell out. But this will be easy to spell out. So let me just double check. We have five non-zero, well, five, uh, five hexadecimal digits, which is C04AB. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven zeros after that. And then we press the enter key. And then this time, you know, I want to say, um, what is it actually representing as a double? But I'm not going to do it, because I want to do it by hand first, so that I understand the process of how to reverse from the binary representation of a double precision number format and get the value represented back. Is that OK? All right. So what we'll do now is really just to look at this. OK. Uh, so uh, this time, I'm going to put this one at the bottom and then put the tablet on the top. So I can still see the pattern that we are using when I work this out. All right, so what we do is now we say, OK, the pattern that we're looking at is 0x, c0, 4, a, b, and then a bunch of zeros. First step is to turn it back into a binary number, you know, zeros and ones. So the c is going to give us 1, 1, 0, 0. The 0 is going to give us 0, 0, 0, 0. The 4 is a 0, 1, 0, 0. How do I know that? It's the table lookup. Okay? Well, I have it pretty much memorized because I have used it so, so often. But if you're not used to it, you, know, you just need a lookup table. That's all you need. 1, 0, 1, 1. And then we just have a whole bunch of zeros after that. So I'll be OK with this step. Is that OK? All right. So I'm just unpacking the bits from hexadecimal digits. Once I have the bits, okay, then I can say, oh, the most significant bit, the one that is the leftmost, is called a sign bit. I know what that one's for. <clears throat> so 
So we say this one is the sine bit. So sine equals one means the value is less than zero. Okay, the value v is less than zero. Then I look at the next um, 11 bits, which we these, this is e, okay? So I have to look at e as an unsigned 11 bit uh, value. So this is 1024, this is four, I didn't change this part. So we are still dealing with 1028 as e, but the actual exponent is e minus 10, 000, uh, 1023. So I have to say e itself is 1028. So with the power of two that we have to deal with, okay, is two to the power of e minus 1023, which is e, uh, which is, oops, two to the power of five. Okay, so that part hasn't changed because I didn't mess around with the exponent. So now we have the fractional part. Okay, this is the fractional part of the mantissa. So I know the mantissa, mantissa is gonna be a one point, okay? And then I concatenate those bits down here. So we got one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, and then the rest are all zeros, which is which makes it a little bit easy, okay? Is that okay so far? Okay, so now I need to look at you know, the mantissa and look at the, um, the exponent and then try to figure out what it is. So I got a few ways to, do, go, to go about doing this. I can say that this is 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1 times 2 to the power of 4. Okay, well, let me, <coughs> let me make it more clear, okay. Is that equality clear? Okay, because the original exponent of two was five, given that the mantissa was normalized. Normalized means it is greater than or equal to one, but less than the base that we are dealing with. Okay, but by adjusting, moving the binary point to the right, I can decrease the exponent by one without changing the value represented by the product. So I can keep doing this until the exponent is gone. So it becomes one one zero point one zero one zero one one times two to the power of three equals to one one zero one point zero one zero one one times two to the power of two. And that equals to one one zero one zero point one zero one one times two to the power of one. And then one last step gets me done. Is that okay? All right, so now it looks like it, I can express it in base 10 fairly easily. So now we look at all the ones and go like, okay, um, those are indicating the presence of what powers of two. This is two to the power of zero, which is one. We, know, we, we have no twos, we got one four. We have no eight, we got one 16. We also have 132. On the other side, we have no halves, but we got one quarter. We also got one eighth. So add these up. So we got 48, 52, 53. So, okay, that's, that's 48, that's 52, that's 53. And then the other side is um, a quarter, which is 0.25 plus an eighth, which is 0.125. So together, that's 0.375. So I'm claiming the hexadecimal representation C04, AB, and then a whole bunch of zeros is representing the bits, the zeros and ones of a IEEE 64-bit double precision floating point number that is representing the value of negative 53.375 because, well, remember the sine bit is a one, so that means the quantity is negative. So that's my theory, okay? Th that's my theorem, which means, you know, I am proposing that this statement is true, okay? It is actually representing the value of negative 53.375. So we go back to GDB and see if GDB agrees because if GDB does not agree, then I have made a mistake somewhere, which 
happens. Just not this time. So is that okay? But do you guys see how I went from went forward, given a particular value, convert it into the double precision floating point number format, and given a bit pattern in a double, convert it back to the value that it is representing. So today's lab is kind of about this, okay? Except you know it, it's a little bit of math stuff. So it will ask you your know, math questions about you know okay yeah you know, well you you'll find out when you get to it. Yep. Correct. It is the prefix of a six uh, of a base sixteen number. So this without a zero x, you know, it will give you a syntax error because without a zero x, you know, because it starts with a alpha. It starts with underscore or an alphabet, so it will try to interpret it as the name of a variable, which it's not. It would not fill. Yeah, so if you give it something that's less than 16 digits, then it will basically just interpret that as the least significant portion of the number. And as a result, you have implicit zeros on the more significant side. Just like with a base 10 number, so if you say 16, that means you know it's 0, 016, 0, 0, 016, and so on. But when you say 1600, the 1600, zero, zero, those two zeros are significant because they, it, they're telling you that you have 0, 1, 0, 010, and then the 6 applies to the hundreds already. So it's the same way with a base 16. Okay, any other questions? If I want to change the value represented, I, if I just want one half of this value, can I do a really quick change to the bit representation and just go like, now it's one half of what it used to be? And how do I do that? Wh which part do I change? The exponent, okay, so if I want to represent only one half of this number, which digit am I gonna change and how do I, what do I change it to? The significant one, zero to the one. Um, which one is the least significant one? <laughs> right, so in the, in the hexadecimal representation, which digit are we gonna be talking about? The fourth, the four, right? The four, which is uh, not the C, not the zero, the four. So if I change the four to a three, then the value represented is going to be one half of this, which is uh, 26 point something, something, something. But we can do that, we can double check, right? You know, so we can just change that one single um, hexadecimal digit and then re-look at the value represented and yeah, well, close. So this is how you kind of, you know, can, you can tweak the values if you know that the value you wanted to tweak it to is relatively relatively easy to specify. You can just look at the hexadecimal representation. Like, yeah, we know which one to tweak. Any questions? What if I want to add one to this the value represented here in in terms of magnitude? In other words, instead of negative twenty six something, I want it to be t a negative twenty seven something. It will be somewhere in the, man, the fractional of the mantissa part, yes. So which part is it gonna be? Now you have to remember our current exponent is four, right, which is a 16. So that means this digit is responsible for um, one half of 16, so there'll be eight, four, two, and one would be in this A. 
So the, the, so the one thing that specifies how many ones we have is in here. A is 1010, one, zero, one, zero, which means I do not have any ones. So if I want this to eventually end up ne representing negative 27 something, I would change the A to a B. Okay? Well, that's all theory. So we have to test it and change the A to a B and then look at the value represented. Uh oh, I changed the wrong one. Duh. Okay. I changed this one, it used to be three, keep it as a three. And then this A, need to change that to a B. There we go. So that's, th it's, these are exercises that you can do you know, with, your, you know, with looking at things yourself. So you just kind of go like, oh, what if, what if I want to tweak it this way? What if I want to add eight to this value? What if, what if I want to subtract 16 from this value? So those are the things that you can kind of go through you know, in your mind and go like, okay, so how do I tweak it so that we can make that work? Any questions at this point? All right. Well, we got five minutes left. So I do want to bring up you know, additional stuff you know, so that we don't waste those five minutes. So in the notes, a lot of this you know, uh, floating point number representation note really has to do with the conversion process. In other words, you know, the, it's, it's, oh, okay. This is a good way to start <laughs> with our next class. This is called regular expression. So regular expression is, um, is a cool way to specify a pattern. How many people have heard of the term of regular expression? Or well, usually it's called rejects. R-E-G-E-X, rejects? Nope, okay. So regular expression is a way you, for you to describe the syntax of something simple. Not quite you know, complicated like the C programming language. That, that's way too much for regular expression to express. But if I want to express syntactically what a floating point number in base 10 should look like, this would do it. So let's, let's check this out. You know, everything is explained here, so I'm just going to go through a verbal explanation at this point. If something is in square bracket, it means it's um, choose one of these two. Okay? So when you see plus minus in square bracket, it means choose one of these two. It can start with a plus or minus. And then the uh, backslash equal to means whatever is right before that is optional. So if you want to emphasize a number is plus, is positive, you can always use a plus, that's fine. If it's negative, you can always use a negative. But if you, if you want it to be um, non-negative and you, d you don't want to waste the additional plus, that's okay, without a sign is fine too. So that explains you know, the open square bracket plus minus close bracket backslash equal to. Backslash D means a single base 10 digit. Okay, every time you see a backslash D, it means zero to nine as a digit. And then backslash open paren and backslash close paren is what we do, what we call a group, okay? So we're just grouping things, kind of like open curly brace and close curly brace in C++ programming. We're just grouping a bunch of stuff and say this entire thing, blah, 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 later on, okay? So what, we're, what are we grouping here? We're grouping a dot, okay? Backslash dot is just an actual decimal point. And then an, an, another digit here, backslash D. But this backslash D is followed by an asterisk. The asterisk means any number of the previous thing. What is previous to the asterisk is a digit. So we can have any number of digits after a decimal point. Um, what about zero? That's fine. Zero is possible. But this entire group is also followed by a backslash equal to, which means that part is optional. So when you specify a um, scientific notation in base 10, the mantissa can be just an integer, like five. Okay, it doesn't have to be five point something. It can be just five. And then we move on to the other portion, backslash open paren, backslash close paren, is indicating the following is in a group, okay? And that group is also optional. What is that group specifying? The E is literal. The E means, yes, 
you really do need a E if you want this optional part to be there. So the E is basically specifying the following is the exponent. How do we specify the exponent? Well, we have seen this already. Square brackets with plus or minus inside and then a black backslash equal to. That means the sign is optional. The sign of the exponent is optional. So if you want to emphasize E plus 16 to emphasize you know, t uh, times 10 to the power of 16, that's cool. But if you want to just say E16, that's fine too, just for the exponent part. This is backslash D again, which is a single digit. But this time after the single digit, we have backslash plus, which means at least one of the previous thing. So the exponent has to start with an E, and it must consist of one, at least one base 10 digit. Okay? And that completes the exponent portion. And that describes the um, base 10 scientific notation. Is that okay? Now it does assume more or less that your um, mantissa is normalized. It's not entirely normalized because you know, backslash D means you know, zero is, uh, is okay too, but a normalized mantissa should not start with a zero. It cannot be zero point something, it has to be one point something. So that part is not captured by uh, the use of a backslash D. But otherwise, this is, this is the syntax to specify syntax. So what, is, what do you think is the name of a syntax that describes syntax? It's called meta-syntax. The knowledge of knowledge is meta-knowledge. So the syntax of syntax is meta-syntax. Now regular expression like this you know, is extremely helpful, especially when you're doing programming. You go like, when I'm programming, you know, I have never th thought of a, a, a situation where this is going to be handy. Well, if you're looking for something in your program, okay, let's say you're looking for a variable name. Um, you know the variable name starts with something, and then it has a suffix of some kind, and so on and so forth. You can use this to describe the syntax of the variable name that you're looking for. If you want to say, I want to find all the instances where this variable is used as the third argument in a function call, this can be helpful. Because you can say, ignore the first argument, it can be anything, ignore the second argument, it can be anything. Oh wait, the third argument has to be this name. This syntax can specify that. So, you know, just as an editor ability, I found use of a, a regular expression. If you do any type of web programming, if you do anything that has to do with user input, this is also very helpful. Why is that useful? Let's say you're the web, you know, uh, you're developing a web interface um, to capture the name, phone number, and the address of an applicant. Okay. How do you validate the input? This is easy because you can just describe, like, you know, the the zip code has to be five digits. If you want to do it the long way. It's backslash D, backslash D, backslash D, backslash D, backslash D, okay? Five digits. If you want to do the short way, it's backslash D, um, open curly brace, five comma five, close curly brace, which means five of the previous thing, okay? But nonetheless, it's just one word, okay? And there are functions in PHP and most scripting languages that will interpret um, regular expression to match a given string. It would just tell you, does it meet this requirement? Okay? It does or does not. Okay? Without regular expression, what do you have to go through to check whether a zip code is you know, at least five digits or not? You need your own code, right? And then the next line asks about a phone number. So how do you double check and make sure the phone number is in the format of open paren, three digits, close paren, three more digits, a dash, and then three more, four more digits. If you write your own code to do it, yeah, you can do it. Well, you can spend your hour of working on that when I'm going to specify using regular expression in two minutes. <laughs> Is that making any sense? How does that have anything to do with your future career as a developer or as a computer scientist? 
is the difference between working hard and working smart. <laughs> you, if you know tricks like this, tools like this, you have to, yes, there's an upfront cost, okay? You have to learn regular expression. But once you have learned it, you can continue to use it in your entire career. If you do not learn this and go like, ah, this is too much trouble, I'll just write my own logic to do it. Then you'll be writing your own logic to do this forever. <laughs> so it's a trade-off, but I'm just telling you that this is actually very useful stuff. Anytime you have to deal with user input, it's already useful. But in many other cases, if you want to interpret the URL of a, of a request, and pick out the parameters, you know, this can be helpful too. It can help you locate, oh, the parameter blah, blah, blah is saying this, the parameter of this is saying that, and so on. So it's not really only useful for user input, it is also useful anytime you have to do any type of parsing that is not structural, that, it, that doesn't have nesting, regular expression is your best friend. If you need nesting, then you, then you need to use a syntax called YAC. YACC. YACC stands for yet another compiler compiler. <laughs> so it specifies the syntax of a programming language and it generates the parser that will recognize that programming language. So all you have to do is to insert code. It's like, oh, once you recognize this portion, do this. Once you recognize this portion, do that. So you will never really have to do your own code to say, Oh, the if has to be followed by an expression with open and close paren and stuff like that. So interesting stuff, not entirely related to assembly language programming, but I'm using that to describe what a scientific notation should look like in base 10, which is the beginning of a ungraded homework assignment. Okay, so we'll work on this a little bit more next Monday, and I strongly recommend you guys to read ahead of me at least read up to this point, but if you can read ahead of me, that will be much better. So we'll continue this on Monday next week. And I'll see you guys over at the lab, because we do have a lab to do today.